Hello, Robert Bastian here of Bastian Voice and Laryngopedia. I have gotten quite a number of questions recently about what to expect early after Botox injection into the upper esophageal sphincter for cricopharyngeus muscle dysfunction. And so um, people are worried about the early post-injection experience. Uh, it's partly because they read things online, Reddit and so forth, and they, they see these comments and they don't know, does this happen to everybody or, or you know, am I, they may read an outlier experience and think, well, is, what's the likelihood that's going to happen to me? Keep in mind that people with RCPD are understandably a little jittery. They are so symptomatic and so miserable. And of course, they have to think about what do I do with work and, and you know, what really is, is going to happen. And so they have questions based on comments that people make online. So I thought I'd just go through a, a discussion about that early experience after Botox injection. And some of this will be repetitive with what I've said elsewhere, but it's a little bit more of a limited scope of discussion than the bigger discussions that I've done. Uh, just to remind those few watching this who don't know what RCPD is, retrograde cricopharyngeus dysfunction. It's people who can't burp or they can't burp enough and so they develop tremendous distress, gurgling that, that can be quiet and internal, or it sometimes can be heard quite loudly to people around them, gurgling noises, bloating, and we think of that as primarily abdominal, but there are also a lot of people with chest and even low neck pressure. And then flatulence um, is often remarkable, including through the night, People are inflating all day and deflating evening especially and through the night. Then there's a whole list that I put in parentheses here, but they're actually very common, just not as universal as the first four, can't burp, gurgling, bloating, and flatulence. And they are hiccups, painful, shortness of breath, not uh, out of breath, like you've been running a race, but that feeling of if I want to take a deep breath, I can't complete it because there's no room to put it. A few people even say, I can't complete a yawn because I can't get that, that the air is so taken up, uh, that the space is so taken up by all this swallowed air that I can't, I feel like I, I can't get a deep breath. Uh, not infrequently, people describe nausea, especially after eating large meals, but some people even with very reasonable amounts of food, they have to stop because they become nauseated. Hypersalivation is the idea that your mouth is watering more than you want it to and you're swallowing excessively. Constipation from constant stretch of the colon. A few people even have autonomic sim symptoms like a racing heart, flushing, that kind of thing. So it taken together is a really terrible disorder and we can treat it and usually get a one and done result in most people uh, just with this very simple Botox injection. How is that done? Well, first of all, to know where the muscle is, it's right here. It's low in the neck, not at the Adam's apple. This is the prominence in males and less prominent in females. Then there's the lower cartilage called the cricoid cartilage and the sphincter is behind that. So the vocal cords and airway are in this column here, and the foodway is in this column. And at the top of the esophagus, bottom of the throat, is this circular muscle, a sphincter muscle, that must let go every time you swallow, and it also needs to let go to let you burp, and that's the rub. It won't let go to let people uh, burp. And so that's one way, uh, one way of injecting is in the operating room under an extremely brief general anesthetic. Uh, so you're just asleep a few minutes, just long enough for us to go through the mouth and uh, go down to the muscle and inject it with a tiny needle. The person wakes up and typically they're just a bit sore. If anatomy is terrible, then sometimes they're a little more sore, but most people they say yeah, it's just a little sore. We infrequently even give any prescriptions for pain uh, in my series of 1,000 and 1,100 or so people uh, in the OR. Um, I think it's about one out of 50 or one out of 100 who even get a prescription. Most people take nothing or they'll take a, a Tylenol or whatever. Uh, now I, by the way, as of uh, about three weeks ago, this is November 2024, so 
as of about three weeks ago, I decided to stop in the operating room to turn my attention to academic things like I'm doing now. And I'm still doing the EMG method in the office. I'm still very busy and full, full time and not retired at all. But I'm, I've put all of my work here in the office. And so that means that I do continue to do the EMG guided uh, injection. And that's through the side of the neck. And sometimes we come from straight the front. And uh, it's not for everybody, but uh, it's a uh, quite effective way of injecting the muscle also. And of course, it's just with a little numbing medicine sitting in a chair, and, and uh, that's how we do it. Uh, pros and cons, which I can talk about in a different place. Um, so I am still doing that. Once we get the Botox into effect, we want to know what are those early effects. That's what is the impetus for this video. Well, the early effect, of course, is going to be burping, not immediately, but uh, sometimes at 24 hours and usually by three, four days. Most people are at least mi micro burping. Um, so there's a, a variability in the time of onset of burping. And uh, so that's all well and good. And sometimes I didn't say this at the beginning, but sometimes people are worried that the burping will be really loud and surprising, and, and that happens rarely. You might read one or two people say it was embarrassing at work because I would burp, I'd cough and burp at the same time, but most people, it's, it's not really a big deal. And people with RCPD often don't know that the vast majority of human burps are silent. So uh, if, you, if you can't burp, I can, and you're around a reasonable number of people, I'll bet you that within the last week you, you've been around 40 or 50 burps that you knew nothing about because they were silent. You were walking past someone in a hallway or sitting in a conference and they burped and you didn't hear it because uh, so many of them are silent. So we're going to leave burping alone pretty much and just talk about swallowing voice and breathing. Um, so swallowing what happens is nothing happens to swallowing for the first one to three or four days. Swallowing is just like always. Then you begin to notice that solid food becomes a little bit problematic. And the way I describe it is this sphincter muscle that is supposed to l relax, let the food through, and then clamp on the back side as part of the mechanism for pushing it down to its next level. It's now limp, so you swallow into it, and it's like a, a limp handshake. It's not stuck. That would be the, the feeling that you might get, that the food is stuck, but it's not stuck. It's in the correct place. It's in a safe place, but it's just hanging. And so, uh, and it's not really soft or liquid things, applesauce, yogurt kinds of things, or liquids. It's more the solid foods. And again, not stuck, it's just hanging. And so you manage it with small bites. I tell people, <coughs> take small bites, chew it really well, and then water wash. And you can do that in two different ways. One way is you chew, and you've got the, the food still in your mouth, and now you add that sip of liquid and swallow everything together. I suppose that's not good manners, but people will understand it. You can try that. And the other is you chew, chew, chew. you tuck your chin and kind of swallow hard and immediately follow it with a sip. So those are the two ways that you can try. Um, and most people say it's, it's really the beginning of that swallowing issue that is problematic because they've never had that experience of food feeling stuck. It isn't stuck, but it's hanging in their throats and they, it's just an awkward sensation. And unless they hear me say clearly it's in the correct place and it's in a safe place, they worry that it might be in the airway. It's not, that's not the worry. Um, and so the only other thing I'd say is that once in a while, it's not often at all, people struggle a little more with swallowing than I've kind of described here. Two reasons. One is there are people who are more afraid and more reactive. They, re they react to the sensation with a lot of fear and fright. Um, and so if you're that person, uh, you know, the person next to you who has exactly the same experience may not react to it quite as much. So that's one reason, I think, why some people have a little more trouble with swallowing. And, and we're all different, so no worry about that. 
And the other is occasionally we think that people are having more, tr they're having less burping and more trouble swallowing. In other words, the prominent symptom is the swallowing symptom and the burping is not yet really taken. And so they still have a pillow of air in their esophagus. And so it's like they're swallowing into that pillow of air, kind of putting a dent in that column of air. And then when the, the anti-grade forces of swallowing are finished, then the pillow of air sort of pushes the food kind of back up. So there have been just a few people. But uh, again, most people get the hang of this. I would say it's not the majority, not even close to the majority, who consider this to be a big deal. They just say, well, it was weird. So I say to people, expect weird, and try not to think of it as dangerous. It's not dangerous, it's just weird. And once in a while, I um, had a young woman who had the most trouble swallowing of anyone in my more than 1,000 patients who said later, a uh, year or two later, when I encountered her again, uh, she said, you know, Dr. Bastian, I, it wasn't that bad. I overreacted. That's what she said. I just overreacted. So you try not to overreact and just understand what it is you're feeling and just try to calmly manage it. And I tell people, everyone gets through it. Nobody's come to harm. Uh, so that's why I say I expect weird and not dangerous. What about voice change? Uh, well, it's very uncommon. Uh, I would say really, really uncommon, uh, but it does occasionally happen, and it's temporary when it does occur, so it's not forever. We haven't altered your voice permanently. And what people describe, uh, oh, I, I forgot to say, I think we've seen it just a tiny bit more with the EMG approach, but it's still very uncommon. In fact, I don't think I've had any voice change now for the last maybe 40 EMG uh, injections, uh, but I think as a group, maybe it, I've seen it, you know, instead of uh, one out of two or three hundred, maybe it's more like one out of hundred if we extrapolate uh, for the EMG. So it's uncommon, but a little bit more with EMG. And uh, so far it hasn't been loss of voice. It's just that people call us and they say, you know, my voice is weak. I'm a singer and I, I, I don't have the power in my upper voice or whatever. Uh, I think uh, 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 Melissa, our physician assistant, has talked to more people than I have. But I remember one in particular, uh, and I'm, of course I'm on the phone, which isn't that sensitive an instrument and thinking to myself, well, I don't really notice much voice change. I mean, this, this can pass for a pretty normal voice on the telephone, but the person said, well, it's, it, my voice seems weak and I like I can't project it. When I call the dog, it's not as strong. And of course, uh, this is temporary, singing and calling the dog. What about breathing noises? Well, of nearly 2,000 patients in our group, we've had maybe six people who describes some noisy breathing. It's not a dire problem. It's just inspiratory phonation, especially at night while sleeping, where they're, they're sound asleep, sleeping really well, but they're making these little <sighs> So they're not struggling to breathe. It's not interfering with sleep, but it's just, or if you are a runner, I think we've had a couple of, of athletes who've said, that when they run, that they make a little bit of noise. And again, it's not dangerous, it's just annoying, and it's temporary. So effects, the prize is the effect, burping, and it's a forever process is what we're after, one and done. Unfortunately, not truly one and done in everyone, but at least 80%. And then the early side effects, which you just have to think of as being weird or an adventure, everyone gets through it. Uh, with those early side effects uh, that I just described. So uh, if you have RCPD, oh my goodness, the, the anxiety is understood, the, uh, you know, perfectly appropriate that you want to know and you're a little concerned about these potentialities, but I hope this is, has reassured you that they're not very common and everybody gets through it. So. Uh, there's the discussion and I hope it helps.